I'm Basil Siokos, the Director of Programming for Doc NYC. Welcome to this Q&A for the film Mayor. Joining me is filmmaker David Osset. Thanks for being part of Doc NYC, David. I'm happy to Thanks be talking to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just ask some really basic questions to get started, but uh, you had previously spent a fair amount of time in the Middle East before taking on this project. Can you talk about sort of what brought you there originally and then what brought you specifically to Ramallah and to, to Musa Hadid's story? Yeah, well, before I had a career in film, I was I was pursuing a different career in refugee law. So I was studying in um, in Cairo at the American University in Cairo and at, w went back and forth occasionally um, just, you know, to visit. And I was spending time in the region. Uh, but then when I got into filmmaking, I was working as an editor on a documentary by a Palestinian director named Mahana Jokubi, and that film was called Off Frame. And I spent about four weeks in Ramallah, and it had been some time since I'd been back there, and I was really uh, taken by how much the city had, had changed, at least to my eye, and that I was noticing like hipster bars and, and nightclubs and the city had free unlimited public Wi-Fi and there was a Jaguar dealership and it's a historically a Christian city. So there, you know, bars open and drinking and everything. And I think even for me as someone who had spent some time in the Middle East, it, it, I still can't shake the, um, the way in which I grow up in the West with a very one dimensional image of what Middle Eastern cities should look like. Uh, uh, particularly what Palestinian cities might look like. And and it was very much an outlier to this idea of, of, of what I would have even expected Ramallah to be, even though I'd spent some time there. So I, I kind of just filed that away for a while, but then um, Mahanad came to New York and we screened um, the film that we had worked on together in New York at the Museum of Moving Image. And, and one night I was just asking him, hey, out of curiosity, what's the mayor of Ramallah like, you know, as a guy, I'm just curious. And he's like, oh, you know, he's interesting. He's Christian. He's, he's very, got a very good sense of humor. He, he, he vapes a lot. And, uh, and he's just like a really stand up guy who people respect. And, and I think immediately this sort of light bulb went off for me of just trying to imagine what his job was like and, and what the day to day of trying to run a city without a country would, would, would would mean and what and I imagined that a film about his work would have a lot of elements that I felt wouldn't have been reflected before uh, in in a film about this part of the world. A lot of potential for for uh, absurd humor and and a lot of potential for for having that humor really stand in stark contrast to to the the horrific nature of the occupation. So I think I was immediately just full of questions that I wasn't sure I'd be able to answer, but I wanted to at least ask them in some sort of a movie. And you talk about you know the the idea of uh, confronting Ramallah as this modern city. It's not the sort of stereotypical view that most uh, I think Westerners have you know have of, of Palestine in particular. Can you talk a little bit about how that informed the way that you approach the lore, which is so non uh, non stereotypical and, and different uh, compared to what uh, typical films about the Middle East have? Um, can you talk a little bit sort of about using those elements to kind of push back against the preconceptions that the audience likely would have? Yeah, well, I was really, I think even from the beginning, before I even started filming, I was thinking like, what what can I do um, stylistically filmmaking wise to really break down the baggage that people are going to be bringing into a film about Israel-Palestine? and. And I think even having that moniker, that label is, is super reductive because it's not actually a film about Israel, Palestine. It's a film about uh, a man who happens to be the mayor of a city who's trying to do stuff. And those things that he's trying to do either succeed or fail um, based on circumstances out of his control. And I, for me, it was like, if I can um, reduce the film to a very uh, small uh, common denominator, something that's very approachable and something that's much more of a, of a sort of following this person's story than all the macro elements that come up when we're talking about this issue that a lot of people I think get turned off by because they think they don't understand it and therefore they can't engage with it. I like to think that that stuff can go out the window because you're really just following a person. And for me, all the elements of the film, like the 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 way the film even begins in like the first five minutes was it was one of the hardest parts of the film to make the the beginning um five ten minutes because i wanted from the get-go to make this tone where it could feel somewhat comic but also um 
open-minded as terms of like, you're not quite sure where you are. And I was trying to use a lot of different kinds of music to, to destabilize you as an audience. And because I think sometimes destabilizing an audience is a good thing because it, it forces you to be like, okay, well, this is not a traditional like look. So therefore I can't bring my old baggage. In. And, I, and I think that a film these days is, I would like to think a, a rare example of a place where you sit down for 80 minutes and like, there's no Twitter when you're watching a movie. Like you can't be told what to think. You can't be told how this is going to feel. You're only left with yourself and how you're responding to the images and the story that you're watching. And I like to think that that's a, a very magical place for an audience to be inside of a, of a, of a, of a world where all they are left with is is just how they're feeling and how they're responding to the images and the and the stories that they're watching and then hopefully opinions can can form ex post facto. Um, so if if I can talk about sort of the the sort of practicalities of how you shot this film with with uh, Musa, um, if you have a really good rapport with him. That's clear from from the film. Um, you are a one man crew. Is that right? That's right. And, and so can you talk about how that influenced the way that the relationship developed between you two in terms of how you shot, when you shot, uh, his comfort level around you, et cetera? Well, I mean, I was, I was, I filmed about 350 hours of footage um, over about a year and a half. Um, and I would take uh, frequent trips, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't never stay longer than four weeks because I needed to refresh myself. I needed, to, I always needed to be able to see our relationship fresh and see Ramala fresh as much as possible. And that was really important for me to maintain my sense of wonder, which is I think what propels me to ever make a film in the first place is not trying to explore, a, 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 I didn't want to say something specific. I wanted just to explore specific questions. And with Musa, I think, I mean, we were really, we were collaborators um, and it took a while for our relationship to, to bloom, but I, I befriended his family and I befriended the people around him and I befriended him. and. And ultimately, I think we, we were doing the same thing. Musa was trying to show Ramallah to the world through his work, and I was trying to show Ramallah the world through Musa's work. Like so, we were once we kind of once we both kind of realized we were doing the same job, except I was the one with the camera. I think it led to uh, a lot of collaboration, and we would talk about like I would ask him like, "What are you most interested in? What are you most proud of in your city?" And being a, a one-person band, uh, I mean. It's hard for sure, uh, but but it was it ended up becoming really necessary. I realized for this project, um, I, I thought early on like, oh, maybe I can raise some money and and get a cinematographer who I really respect to come shoot with me. But the Arabic language issue was was would be a roadblock for certain cinematographers. Also, I I, I could tell early on that having you know Palestinian people with me on a crew was gonna make certain people clamp up because there was this feeling that people had of like oh he's just like he doesn't know what we're saying like oh, we can be kind of honest you know there's there was no guards up and Ramallah's so small that everyone kind of knows everyone so like if I had a Palestinian uh you know fixer or PA with me it's like oh well I know his father or like I know his uncle or something and and there could be a uh, sort of knee-jerk against that versus all I am is just this observer who's not speaking much, who's constantly got the camera in front of his face, even if I'm not filming. And I think people just got to know me as this benign presence. And I think just as a filmmaker, my goal always is to just be as pleasant as possible <laughs> and be just like a really good presence in the room. Like, I, I think it's like, why else would someone let me into a space and be filming these things unless I was pleasant and like fun to be around and, and people didn't feel like they had to have their guard up. And that was a lot easier to do as one person. And can we back up for a second about your own working knowledge of, of Arabic? Um, you know, how good is it? And did, did that, you know, you said, you said earlier that, you know, maybe people spoke more freely because they'd assumed you didn't know quite as much, but, uh, you know, if, if you, if you're not fluent, um, did you catch anything on camera that you were surprised was spoken about in front of you after you had it fully translated? Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of that process? Yeah, I would say my Arabic when starting out was about as good as like a very smart toddler's Arabic and, and that I could uh, understand basic sentiments of things and <clears throat> had a couple keywords, which is really all I needed at the beginning. Um, just like I could, I could get a sense of what conversation would be about um, and film it. Uh, there were definitely lots of conversations where I was completely lost. Um, 
and was essentially just filming in a foreign language. Uh, but that I think a it helps to film 350 hours because you know it increases your odds of getting th certain things. But I would it would encourage my my shooting style to just make sure that I was getting long takes of of people's faces um, as they were speaking um, of Musa to try to track the emotional resonance in the room. Um, and I feel like that's true for cinematographers in any language, whether they know it or not, is like you're you're not just paying attention to what things look like, but how they feel and what the mood is in a room. And I think that was really important for me is facial gestures. And I was lucky with with Musa, who who is um, I think a really wonderful presence on screen and in, in terms of his his physical uh um the, the way he represents his feelings or his mood physically it reminds me of a sort of almost like a Jacques, Jacques Tati character uh for, and, and that like it's just very physically expressive and so I could take a lot of guidance from that even if I didn't understand what was going on and I think people's comfort level with me was such that like I, I wouldn't really get into conversations with people um so much in the first place um but if I did I would mostly chat with people and broken Arabic or in English, uh, because I did want to give this feeling of like, okay, this guy's not like waiting for me to say something salacious. Like he's not here to get a scoop. And that's, right. I think that would be important for any politician or people in any sort of office space to understand is not the case about someone like me is like, I'm not there to just like get a, get something spicy and then run away with it. I, I wanted to be an ally to people there and I wanted people to feel comfortable with me and I think that that just took that took some time but but I had I had time so it was right fine. I mean yeah you weren't just there for a, a couple of weeks you kept on going back so it obviously built up that that trust over time yeah. but I but I do wonder about um any issues you might have encountered at least early on or um as an American filming within the region particularly when it came with came to um, interacting with the Israeli military or checkpoints or anything like that? Was that, were there any instances where you, you felt um, that that was a drawback or, or that you encountered difficulties? I, I, well, I will say that I had zero difficulties filming in Palestine. Um, there was never a problem with me having a camera out in, a, in any kid's situation. Um, there was never a problem with filming on the street. No one had ever once come up to me it's just, you know, giving me a hard time. Uh, going back and forth, I would I would fly into Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv and then cross the checkpoints into Palestine. I would encrypt my footage back and forth. Uh, flying back and forth into Israel um, is is uh, difficult um, in, in for in many ways in terms of a lot of questions and a lot of security. And I think there there was some wariness around stamps on my passport from Muslim countries and things like that. But my first name is the same as the first name of the airport. So there was certain benefits that I had as a traveler um, in terms of uh, what my my supposed identity was and, and what my reasons were for, for traveling. But I had it a lot easier than other people would have it. And of course, I had it much easier than if I were, uh, you know, for example, a Palestinian person with some with a Palestinian name, where it would be, um, if, if not impossible, then then extraordinarily taxing and difficult to be crossing through the checkpoints and and in, in and out of the country so frequently. And I wonder, so, I mean, you talked about this at the very beginning, but sort of this, this kind of tension that the film demonstrates of the city being both modern and trying to increase tourism and plan for holiday celebrations, et cetera, et cetera. But then also the realities of life under occupation and how that can be sort of upended in the second, you know, it, most dramatically we see in the sort of, what I like to think of as the siege of, of City Hall, you know, that sort of, the, how normalized was that for Musa and his staff versus how did you to that being in the moment and maybe not as comfortable or familiar with these kinds of uh, ha happenings? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story that I think embodies that, which is, you know, after that, that siege moment um, at, at City Hall, I remember at the, at the end of that, you know, I, I finally go home. It's it's late, late, late at night, and I just remember thinking, oh my god, oh my god this was insane. Like I just can't believe that this happened, uh, and it's not common. Um, I mean, it's not unprecedented, and because th this happens all the time, you know, these these sorts of military incursions into Ramallah, uh, but it was relatively uncommon for this to be like around dinner time in the center of like the the nightlife area of of Ramallah. 
um, in restaurants and so on. So I was like, this is this, and, and the fact that it happened at City Hall in this, you know, two square block radius, which is almost a main character in the film. Like it, 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 I just couldn't believe that this had happened. And I was thinking to myself, well, I got to wake up really early tomorrow. Everyone's going to be talking about this at the office. You know, I've got to, you know, film the rocks being swept. And I just like, it's going to be a really crazy day tomorrow of all of this reckoning. And so I, I get up early and then I go to the office and I'm, you know, I'm really expecting that this is going to be like a main point of conversation. But the only thing really happening is uh, Musa walks in to the office, same time as always. And he's like, okay, we got to go uh, check out the doors in the school uh, because I think they got some new ones in and we got to make sure that they're up to snuff. And I was like, okay, yeah. And then when we just go through our day and I realized, yeah, th th this is not, um, I was bringing this idea that this was such a big event, but uh, of course, the 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 severity of it was was unusual, but the act of it was entirely uh, normal uh, in terms of that is what life under occupation is, and that's what people are prepared for. And it's it doesn't take away from the horror of it, uh, but it was banal for for people in this horrendously um, moving way for me as an outsider. And that was a that that experience that I felt of being surprised by this is, is something I tried to put into the film, which is when after that siege happens, it, the next day begins and life continues as, as normal. And I think that that part of the film, I would like to think an audience is, you know, holding on to the stuff that's coming earlier in the film with the festivities and the Christmas flash mob. And maybe at that point in the film, you know, first 10 minutes, you're thinking, well, this seems like a lot of effort for, for you know, something that's a little silly. But I, I would like to think that by the end of the film, you're, you're realizing what these gestures actually mean. And it comes back to this, to almost helping answer this question that I started the film with, this idea of how do you run a city when you don't have a country? And I think that for me, that moment sort of proves the answer is like, you run it as though you have a country, like you try to do the things that you're doing as though you can, as, as though you have this dignity that's being taken away from you and sapped by a military occupation of your country. Like you just continue to try, you continue to work. And that that scene really typified that for me. And, and speaking of sort of um, Musa's reactions to things, um, has can you share his reactions to the film? Yeah, I, I showed him a, a, a version of the film uh, in person uh, a couple months before lockdown and, and, a, and a month or two before the film premiered, uh, him and his family, and they, they really loved it, which was, which was very gratifying. Um, I was very grateful. I would have been very confused and, and, and upset if they didn't like it, because right. uh, I really felt as though we were making the film as, as a team. And um, how, how often are you in touch with them? And can you let us know how Ramallah has been affected, impacted by the pandemic and how he and his family have been sort of weathering the storm? Yeah, I mean, we talk all the time. He was going to come out for the film fest, for the film's premiere. Uh, he was heading, heading to the airport when the lockdown happened. Uh, so that's been a, a very sad thing that he hasn't been able to experience the film and, and that most audiences haven't been able to experience the film. Um, but we're still talking all the time. Uh, Ramallah and the West Bank are, are, and Gaza are not in a good place right now. Um, the, there's been a couple waves of COVID, um, but they're dealing with it. Um, travel is essentially forbidden. Uh, there, there's, they, they need even more, it was already difficult, of course, to travel, but now they even need even more permissions to leave. It's really become mm -hmm. as, almost as much of an outdoor prison as Gaza has been in the last several decades. Uh, so, so it's trying times. Um, and of course, recent uh, agreements between Gulf countries and the United States and Israel have only furthered this sort of isolation that a lot of Palestinians are experiencing and feeling um, in terms of the, the world continuing to kind of turn their back on what's going on there. Uh, so so it's, it's certainly been a rough time, but, and, but we certainly hope that that can start to shift the more people understand what's happening and realizing that this is happening because we're, um, we're, we're, we're unable in the West to, to apply pressure to our public representatives to enforce upon them that this is uh, something that we do not agree with and that, that this, is, uh, this is an unfair treatment of people. And uh, that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons I really wanted to make the film is, is to right. at least give people a, 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 an understanding that perhaps was absent 
and I think that this issue is so is so clouded as we were talking about at the beginning of our conversation is so clouded in, in in dismissal because it's like well I don't understand it it's too complicated therefore I can't but I did I did want to break it down to a really simple element here which is like if you can watch this film and, and perhaps some and perhaps agree that this might not be um, a fair way for people to be treated and for people to live that was really important to me and I think you know ever since the lockdown in the U.S. and and with COVID I, I would like to think that this can help create even a little bit more of a connection to, uh, for Americans who might might have thought that something like this would be un, 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 impossible to understand. But like the the freedom of movement, the, the ability to go to a restaurant, the ability to to, to live a normal life. I mean, the, these, these are things that we've had to deal with for several months and we're causing m millions of Americans, uh, you know, to go out into the streets uh, in protest right. and imagine living under this for 70 years. Right. Well, with that, um, I want to thank you so much for making the film and for sharing that story. Uh, and I'm glad that we're able to be part of it in terms of showing it to Dr. Noisy's audience. Um, we do have to wrap it up, but I want to thank you so much, David, for, for speaking with me today and for sharing the film. My pleasure. Thanks, Basil. And thanks, everyone, for watching.